Hey guys, we hope you enjoy this free clip of Aggressive Progressives on the Young Turks. This is just a preview of what you will receive with TYT membership. That means exclusive interviews, panel discussions, and more of Jimmy, and of course, me. Check out this next clip, and if you like what you see, you can access full episodes of Aggressive Progressives by becoming a member. Head to tyt.com slash join now. Hi, everybody, welcome back to the Aggressive Progressives. I'm here with Malcolm Fleshner and Steph Zamorano. We have uh, with us a uh, union leader for Los Angeles teachers, Glenn Sachs is back with us. Hi, Glenn, how are you? I'm good, I'm happy to be here. I'm, I'm just a strike captain, I'm a foot soldier. Okay, a strike captain, okay. That sounds much better. I oh. actually like strike captain That's better. stronger. Uh, sounds better than it is. <laughs> so you guys, you there's- Like a lot of things in life. <laughs> so please, everyone is saying uh, that the LA teachers won this strike, and can you tell us what your demands were and what, what agreement did you get on them? Okay, yeah, I do believe we won this strike. Um, one of our biggest demands was to get rid of section 1.5. And what that was, was something in our contract that said that the district could declare a fiscal crisis, a fiscal emergency, and then they could get rid of whatever class size averages and caps that we had negotiated. Now, we did that, we gave them that in, in good faith, and it was a, a reasonable thing in its time. If there's a fiscal crisis, like during the Great Recession, we understand the schools aren't gonna have as much money they're gonna to have to lay some people off and raise class sizes. The problem is the district used it every year. They used it in bad faith, they used it every year. So whatever we negotiated about class sizes was worthless. They could just take it and tear it up whenever they wanted. And so that was our biggest demand. And a lot of very smart, very knowledgeable people told us that we would quote, never, never get the district to get rid of 1.5. And we did, we got them to get rid of 1.5. And that's a big deal, so now all the class size class size that we negotiate, uh, the district's gonna have to stick to. So it's really gonna lead to a, a new era in terms of class sizes uh, in LAUSD. And that was the biggest issue, the class sizes and 1.5, that was the biggest issue in this strike. So I don't think people realize how big classes are in Los Angeles, right? So again, one of the richest cities and the richest country in the world, one of the bluest cities and the bluest state in the, in the country. And how big are their class sizes? Well, you know, a lot of them are very big. At my school, we have 35 or 40 classes uh, over 40 people. Two of my five classes are over 40. Two of my five classes last year were over 40. Uh, there's an English teacher here who's got 216 mm -hmm. kids, 43 plus per mm -hmm. class. And, and I, I don't know what on earth they're thinking. I don't know how on earth she's supposed to read and grade all that stuff. You know, we're supposed to be teaching them how to read. You have them I mean, pardon me, teaching them how to write, they write, someone has to read it, someone has to evaluate it, someone has to help them. I don't know how on earth you do that with 43 kids per class. We have an AP US government class here. Uh, mercifully, I'm not the one who teaches it, a, a colleague of mine does, 52 kids, 52 kids oh. in an AP US government class. They're supposed to be doing a lot of writing, okay? They're supposed to be doing a lot of in-depth thinking, and you've got kids uh, uh, sitting on the floor in that room. So and what people don't realize is that whenever they hear these, these statistics about how the United States doesn't test as well as the rest of the world, and we've, we're falling behind the rest of the world as far, as far as educational achievement benchmarks, well, places like, say, Finland, a small country which decided to actually invest in their education, is doing remarkably well. They're in like the top three education in the world, in Finland. And what are they doing? Instead of having 50 kids in a classroom, they have 20 kids in a classroom. And instead of having one teacher, they have a teacher and two helpers. So that's three teachers for 20 kids. We have one teacher for 50 kids here. Now, what was the cap? So I just want people to realize that, that it's unbelievably overblown, the class sizes here in the United States, especially, in, again, Los Angeles, one of the richest cities and the richest country in the world, the bluest city and the bluest state, and we still have overflowing class sizes because we just give lip service to education. We don't actually, show me your budget and I'll show you what your morals are. So what was your class size cap? What was the cap that you got? Well, you know, the, the caps vary. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it could. You know, there's elementary school, there's high school, there's there's uh, special ed, there's what's called Fabao, primarily Hispanic, Black, or or Asian. Um, but as a general rule, just to say for high school, the averages were 33 or 34, the caps were 38 or 39, which isn't great. You know, it isn't great. But no. we couldn't even get them to obey that. 
And now finally they're gonna have to obey that and phased in over the next few years, they're gonna have to lower that. Excuse also, we got them to agree to immediately, meaning for the fall, class sizes in English classes and math are gonna drop by six or seven per class. So, you know, the gains are substantial. The district is gonna have to hire a lot of new teachers. Um, we understand it can't all be done overnight, but the, the contract has substantial gains for us. So tell me about the, the a big problem right now facing funding for public schools in Los Angeles is the drainage of funds or the siphoning of funds into charter schools, right? So when a kid doesn't go to a public school but goes to a public charter school, the money that that kid uh, that we that the government would spend for that kid now leaves that public school and goes to a private corporate charter school. That's correct, right? Yeah, there, there's several financial issues we have facing us. Part of it, we're not getting enough money from Sacramento. Part of it, our enrollment is declining. You know, it's so expensive to live in this city. A lot of our people, a lot of you know, parents at my school, you know, they 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 can't get by here, so they'll move to Modesto or Bakersfield or something like that. But part of it is the charter drain. It's estimated to cost us between five and six hundred million dollars a year. Um, you know, when when a student leaves LAUSD, they take all of their money with them. But we're still stuck with a certain amount of what are called fixed costs, right? If I have a class of forty three kids and four of them leave, we lose all the money for those kids. But we can't, you know, we don't cut my salary by ten percent. Wouldn't want to give them any ideas. We don't cut my salary by ten percent. The electricity's not cheaper. The heat's not cheaper. The building isn't cheaper. So we're stuck with certain fixed costs. So when these kids leave, it, it does hurt us significantly financially. And we're not the only district in that position. A lot of districts throughout California are in that position. In fact, that's one of the issues coming up in the uh, the Oakland uh, possible strike uh, labor dispute. And so how do we know that the LAUSD is gonna make good on their promises? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, there's what you agree to and that's what you can enforce. I, I, I think that's an issue. Do we know they're gonna make good on their promises? I hope they will. Um, but I wouldn't be shocked if we have to strike again in order to enforce the contract. I wouldn't be shocked. Uh, you know, I mean, I think they, you know, they got clobbered this time. We had so much popular support, solid picket lines, very few scabs. Uh, you know, they got beaten so badly. I, I would think that they would not want to provoke a strike again uh, in the near future. But you know, you never know what they're going to do. They provoked this strike. Uh, they forced us to strike. The strike was provoked. We sat there like good little boys and girls and negotiated with them for 21 months while they gave us almost nothing. And we were forced to strike. And, and hopefully they have enough sense to not force us to do that again. Okay, uh, do you have any questions, Malcolm? Steph? Well, I was just, I, I, I wanted to know, uh, it's Malcolm Glenn, uh, about where this is going, uh, the labor movement and teachers across the country. Do you anticipate that there's gonna be, uh, you know, more strikes in other places in Virginia uh, or, or else you said, oh, you mentioned Oakland. Uh, where's uh, where's, where's it going next? Yeah, there's a possibility of a, a strike in Colorado. Uh, I, I can't remember whether it was Marx or Engels who said a revolution has a long tailwind, meaning there's a revolution that affects a lot of things afterwards, okay? Uh, a victorious strike has a long tailwind. And, and we knew that, we knew that, it was very clear. We knew we weren't just fighting for our kids and for our district. We knew that whatever we did, whether we won or lost, would have a large effect on the rest of the state and the rest of the country. Uh, and frankly, you know, the, this strike went better than I thought it would. I, I, I didn't think we'd have the popular support that we did. Uh, the, the charter people, the anti-union people, they've spent 25 years doing a hatchet job, a PR hatchet job on public education and public educators and teachers unions. I was surprised by the amount of popular support that we got. I also was a little surprised by how solid our picket lines were. Pleasantly surprised, I'm happy that I was wrong, but I was a little surprised. Um, but you know, going into this, I thought, you know, look, if we win this, it'll have a good effect across the country. And on the other hand, frankly, I didn't want to be in a position where we lost it and we ended up, you know, causing problems for for everybody else. So I'm very happy that we were so successful. But yeah, this is definitely. A movement, you know, we saw teacher strikes last year that were successful. We're the second biggest school district in the country, so our successful strike is going to have a lot of influence on the rest of the state and the rest of the country, and that's a good thing. Hey, Glenn, it's Steph. I'm just curious. So, did you get nurses? Did you get librarians? Did you get a more support staff? Okay, yeah. So we got the district to agree they're going to hire 150 nurses for the fall, and then 150 nurses for the following year. So we'll have nurses in every single school. 
uh, 41 librarians for the fall, 41 librarians more for the following year. So we'll have a librarian in every secondary school. Uh, the counselor ratio, student counselor ratio, uh, they agreed to bring it down to 500 to one. Wow. So they're gonna have to hire more counselors. Exactly how many is a little bit uh, unsure right now, a little bit unclear right now. So yeah, we, we won our central demands, we did. I mean, we were reasonable. We realized you can't you know, turn around and hire 4,000 people tomorrow. We understand that there, there are practical considerations, but the, the district agreed to our uh, demands. And uh, you know, I hope the district, uh, how would you say it? I hope they own this. I hope they, you know, they did the right thing for the students. And I hope that they, even though it took some persuading, I hope they believe in what they did and they, they work hard to make it work for everybody. What, what, do you, uh, what do you chalk it up to? Well, the strength of the union in this fight, uh, the strength of the picket lines and the support from the parents? What, what, where do you think it all came from or what was the key? Well, I think it was all those things. Um, you know, the picket lines were solid. We had a handful of schools where, where there were a significant amount of scabs, but in most schools there were little or nothing in the way of scabs. My school, we have 107 uh, UTLA members here, only two of them scabbed. So 105 out of 107 honored the picket line. And that was fairly typical. Uh, my school is pretty large, but you know, there were a lot of schools that you know, zero, one, two, uh, people cross the picket line. So the, the solid picket lines were a big deal. So, that's and there fantastic. Was so I, 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 you know, those people who, like you said, you had two scabs at your school. And so, uh, you know, my wife used, it was to be a teacher and there were people who didn't support the union and uh, they would say, well, why do I have to get paid just as badly as the worst teacher in our school? I should be, uh, and, I'm, and so what my wife would say to them is, well, why don't you go out and test a free market? There's lots of private schools around. Why don't you leave our union school and go test your theory and let's see if the free market actually rewards you for your, for your li uh, skill level as a teacher. They never do. They never leave the public school, yet they sit there and they take all the benefits that the union are willing to fight for, but they're not gonna fight for it themselves. In fact, they undermine that union. And if they really believed in their free market system, why wouldn't they leave your union school, school that they're so oppressed by and go find a goddamn job in a private school? Well, some of the things you were saying there about undermining us and taking the benefits and not taking the cost, those were the things that were being yelled at the scabs on the picket line uh, during this during this strike. I worked at non-union schools for six years, so I know what it's like. And they work you like a, a dray horse. You know, mm -hmm. you're like a bug on a skill. There's always some new stupid thing you got to do. Uh, you know, you got to go do yard duty at lunch or nutrition or before school or after school. You got to sub for endless other classes. I mean, it's endless the amount of things that they have you do. And uh, you know, look, I did it when I was young and they exploited the hell out of me. I did a very good job for them. I worked 70 hours a week for my lousy little $1,600 a month take home pay. That was the most I ever made doing it. Not that I'm bitter. Um, <laughs> and people who, who think that it doesn't matter having a union, that the union's not important, they just don't know what they're talking about. And, and it, oh, I, I sometimes wonder, maybe we should have a scared straight program where you gotta go teach at a non-union yeah. school for six months or a year. Well, and the first then, person uh, I'd like to have do that back. is Butner. I would like him to go teach at a school. <laughs> Yeah, isn't it amazing yeah, well, that we have- It'd be nice if Butner taught it all, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing, like Arne Duncan, he was the Secretary of Education under Obama. He was a big charter school backer. He wanted to undermine public education. He still does. He was against you on the strike. You know how many days he spent in the classroom? Zero. And a Butner, the, the LAUSD, you know how many days he spent in the classroom? Zero. Zero. So why do we have people running our education systems that have no idea on how to actually educate people? And I'll tell you why. It's because the capitalists wanna get their grubby fingers in our education money so they can suck, suck money out of it and put it in their pockets. That's what this is about, right? Well, it, there's some of that. Uh, some of it is they wanna weaken the teachers union. Some of it is they wanna weaken the Democratic Party. You know, it's kind of interesting having to explain to my students that part of the reason why they have to have large class sizes is because they don't want to hire more teachers because they don't want to strengthen the unions because the unions give money to the Democratic Party. So there's a whole chain there. So yeah, there's a lot of different reasons, but they're all they're all pretty uh, pretty unpleasant, pretty unpleasant reasons. Okay, well, Glenn, I really appreciate you taking time and giving us an update on the victory for the Los Angeles teachers. Uh, it was a strike, it was over really quickly. It was like, a, was it like five days or something? It went, it went by quickly, right? It was, uh, yeah, well, seven, seven work days. Okay. Yeah, it, it was pretty quick. I mean, we hit them with everything we had and uh, you know, we were able to win a quick, decisive victory. And that's what we wanted. You know, we, we had no desire to drag it out, but we, we weren't gonna settle uh, unless we had a good contract and we got that.
Okay, Glenn, thank you very much and congratulations on your union victory. I hope this inspires a lot of workers around the country to uh, not, not to strike or to unionize and uh, to have and to speak with one voice to corporate power. So thanks for being here. I appreciate it. All right, my pleasure. Okay. All right, so we got uh, that was good. That's yeah. a good. That's a, very few victories for workers in this uh, in this day and age. So it's nice to have him. Did on. you hear how many nurses they're getting? They're getting 150, and they're getting librarians. And that you have to you have to go on strike to get librarians to get at librarians a public school. At a school, it should be an embarrassment to Butner. Yeah, yeah. I mean, hearing the things that the, their demands, you know, they're, they seem, yeah, know. seem so incredibly reasonable. Like having a nurse in every school for five days a week. Yeah, that like you have to fight for that. Right, it's I know. crazy. They have over 600,000 students that attend that those schools. You get one nurse a week. They would have them come in one day a week. Yeah. What? I hope so you're what if sick I'm on sick, Friday. Be sick on that day. <laughs> okay, so that was uh, that was great. Thanks for. And going. it's inspiring. This is a, you know I mean the uh, the the. Uh, the, the government workers, the TSA workers, who really helped end the the, uh, the government shutdown, and yes. the LA teachers, and all the teachers across the country w w went on strike last year. I mean, I think there's there's definitely a a, a wave of union and worker activism, and uh, like the, the 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 woman who's the head of the flight attendants union was saying, yes. we need a general strike in this country, and you know when she said it, nobody laughed, like. Because that's the kind of thing that would seem just preposterous in the United right. States. That's the kind of thing they do in France, yeah, or you know, in some Latin American country or something. We don't do that here, but it, it you know, it's well, people like it's realize. Well, just like Glenn Sack, people can't even afford to stay live in this city anymore. People have to keep moving out to farther and away from city center so they can afford to have a house in the United States. So. Uh, people are treading water all over. Again, 80% of workers live paycheck to paycheck. So when and someone says we need a general strike, people are like, yeah, I'm a, whatever that is, I'm for it, I think. <laughs> and I don't even you, know what it is. Did you hear how many students per counselor there are? So they negotiated 500, 500 per counselor. Per counselor. So you tell me how much time you're able to counsel kids <laughs> when you have 500. That's a lot of students. And to don't be counselors able to. usually teach classes too? Uh, not necessarily. I've, in the schools I've worked in, they they're counselors full time. Oh, okay. But Although, they also have to facilitate a lot of admi administrative stuff, like if they're testing being provided. So a lot of times they're taken out of their office where they could be counseling kids, but they're instead they have to go and do other kind of administrative stuff. The uh, when he was saying how few scabs there were in his school, I was like, wow, because that, that school had a. 52 students, uh, AP history student. You know, uh, I, w I was thinking that'd be a pretty good gig. I just, you know, who wouldn't want to run in there and face 52 students you got to teach AP history to? No kidding. Well, every time I would show up to work, there was a line outside the office door for people to become a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about Venezuela now because I'm certain that no matter where you've gone for your news about Venezuela, it's been incorrect. Um, what people don't know about Venezuela is, well, there's, they're, having, they're having an economic crisis, Jimmy, aren't they? I mean, socialism doesn't work. So what I would tell them is that the, the most powerful uh, entities in the world have been trying to crash Venezuela's economy. Well, who is that and what do you mean? Well, Saudi Arabia has been overproducing oil. Why do you think oil is only $28 a barrel right now? It's because Saudi Arabia has been willing to take that loss to overproduce it, so they can up up uh, uh, introduce instability into Venezuelan's economy. So then the United States can engineer a right wing coup, so that we can all get our hands on that oil because there's more oil in Venezuela than there is in Saudi Arabia. That's how much oil there is in Venezuela. So. What we did was they did, they overproduced their oil, drove down and screwed them over with this, so tanked their economy. The United States then puts economic sanctions on them even further. Well, what, what kind of say, that sounds benign, sanctions. Well, for instance, uh, you're not allowed if you in Venezuela to get a loan from the United States banks. You can't get a loan, which means they, they cannot finance their oil production anymore. So you're further killing them. And uh, so all these sanctions, and uh, and all these uh, and all the overproduction of oil is what's wrecking their economy, and the capitalists there, the capitalists there also want to get Maduro out because they want their capitalist buddies to take over that country. So they're the ones holding back stuff. That's also happening there. Um, is Maduro? People will say, well, Maduro's a bad guy. 
Uh, Maduro jails journalists. Uh, well, I know that Mike Preisner, former Iraq veteran, or, or an Iraq veteran and the host of Eyes, Eyes Left podcast, went to Venezuela and he went to newsstands and he every newspaper there was critical of Maduro. Every headline, there were headlines saying Trump should uh, Trump should oust Maduro. That's a headline on a paper in Venezuela. The people who they go, oh, he jails his opposition leaders. The people who are trying to uh, overthrow the government in illegal coups get locked up. So that's what's happening in Venezuela. And are people, are there people that are protesting against Maduro? Yes. Are there people also protesting in support of Maduro? Yes. That's the protest they don't show you. So people are protesting against Maduro because they want to get rid of, there's always an opposition in every country. So they're protesting him, they show those, they don't show the protests blocks away that are just as big supporting Maduro. Is Maduro unpopular? Yes. You know, you know who's less popular than Maduro? His opposition. So Venezuelans want Venezuela to handle their problem. They don't want outside agitators like imperialists, United States or Saudi Arabia to come in and overthrow their government, which is what we're doing. And so we have to make up all these stories, just like that all, every guy, this guy's a bad guy. Oh, the, the leader's a bad guy. The leader's a bad guy, Maduro's a bad guy. What does he do? Oh, he imprisons journalists, Oh my God. He imprisons his opposition, Oh my God, you mean people? So who isn't a bad guy? The United States is in bed with 70% of the world's dictators. We don't overthrow them. Why don't we overthrow Saudi Arabia? They're a dictator, that's oppressive. Why don't we overthrow them? Because of the petrodollar. Mm -hmm. This has nothing to do <laughs> with uh, Maduro being a bad guy. So if that idea is in your head, it's the same idea that Saddam Hussein's a bad guy. Gaddafi's a bad guy. You remember that? These guys are bad guys. The worst guy at any given moment is the guy running, the, the guy causing the most destruction in the world. The bad guy is who's ever running this country at any given moment. That's the worst guy in the world. So this idea that when you when you find yourself saying the words, who, whoever leader of whatever next country we want to overthrow is a bad guy, you hear those words come out of your mouth, that's propaganda you've internalized that is now coming out of your own mouth and you don't even know it. The worst guy in the world at any given moment is the guy causing the most destruction in the world at any given moment is the guy running our country. The biggest drone program in the world is ours. The biggest terrorist program in the world is the United States drone program. We just set the Middle East on fire. We ran out of bombs. What kind of good guys run out of bombs? So stop doing that, but people can't help themselves. That's propaganda. When you hear yourself saying Maduro's a bad guy, that's Saddam's a bad guy, Gaddafi's a bad guy. It doesn't matter, that's propaganda. It doesn't matter who's a good guy or a bad guy. We're in bed with 70% of the world's dictators. The worst guy in the world, everybody in the United States on the left will tell you is Donald Trump. Should somebody invade our country? Donald Trump's a racist white nationalist who is also a traitor to our country. Shouldn't somebody invade us and save us? Okay, uh, so now I'll, let me throw, I have an actual reporter, an actual reporter who's actually in Venezuela and not, an, an, and not a TV studio in Manhattan, like those asswipes at MSNBC and CNN. An actual reporter who's actually in Venezuela, who actually knows something about Venezuela and isn't afraid to say it because he doesn't worry about losing his $30,000 a day job for telling the truth about Venezuela. We have that guy. I'm gonna show you the video, but when we first throw it to my panel to get their initial impressions of the Venezuela reporting that has been from coast to coast in this country. Oh, okay, you know, Jimmy, when you were talking about it, I was hoping that you would mention the petrodollar. Thank you. Because that is so interesting that that is actually affects what we're doing throughout the United States, throughout the world. Have you heard the word petrodollar? No, you don't. You don't hear, hear it. it anywhere. So I, you know, it made me think about when I was when I was a high school English teacher, and uh, as the years went on, and we were in Iraq and still in Iraq, that my students would often say to me, "Oh, come on, Ms. Amaro, you know why we're there? Oil." I know. So everybody says that's why we're there, right. oil. But that doesn't seem to kind of matter to a lot <laughs> no. of people right now regards to Venezuela. Right. So you know, is it oil? Hmm. Is it the petrodollar? Hmm. 
That's where I stand. I, I stand on hmm. And people don't even know what the petrodollar is. It's so not talked about in this country, even though it's the thing that's under, it undergirds our economy, right? It's the thing that boosts it up. So when we went off the gold standard, we made a deal with Saudi Arabia that when someone wants to buy oil from you, you make them pay you in dollars, United States dollars. So what does that do? That artificially keeps our, our currency afloat. And then they take a lot of that money and they reinvest it in treasury bonds back here in the United States. So that's why Barack Obama, when they passed a law allowing people to sue Saudi Arabia over 9-11, had to get on a plane and fly to Saudi Arabia that day to calm people down about, no, 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 please don't take your money out of our economy. Please don't stop monetizing things in the dollar. Please don't do that. So that's why we're in bed with Saudi Arabia, which is why we're committing a genocide in Yemen, which is why we're bombing in Syria. Which is why we're now in Venezuela too, a part of the reason. Do you see how this works? They'll never tell you this at MSNBC, ever. Rachel Maddow will never, her ass will be fired so fast. Which is why she'll never say something like this. And why she is a toady for the military industrial complex. And that whole station is not just her. The, every establishment, even YouTube shows, I've, it's unbelievable what's happening. So that's why this show and Jenk Uger funds this show, so I can come here and tell you the truth about Venezuela. Uh, should I go to this reporter? Sure. Uh, actually, one thing I wanted to say is that uh, you mentioned that Venezuela gets accused, or Maduro gets accused of uh, jailing journalists, and that's something that our allies don't do. Saudi Arabia, <laughs> they don't jail journalists. Now. If he had been cutting them up with bone saws, bone saws, that's okay. At an embassy in Turkey, that's okay. That will, you know, yes. Again, exactly right. Our biggest ally, Saudi Arabia, they dismember journalists with bone saws, <laughs> and there's no price. We don't invade them. There's no price to pay. Hey, Barack Obama tortured Chelsea Manning in public. Barack Obama tortured Chelsea Manning for years, and everybody knew it. Why didn't somebody invade us? So don't give me this. You care about journalists in other country. Right now, Julian Assange is being tortured in the middle of London by our government. And no one gives a shit. So don't tell me you give a shit about journalists, because you don't. And the, the bottom line is that anytime the United States government alleges that it's engaging in foreign interventions on a humanitarian <laughs> basis is a lie. It's a lie. And, and the Democrats go along with Democrats, you know, that's. It just underscores the point that when there's bipartisan agreement on something between Democrats and Republicans, that's when you got that's that's the real danger. As George as George Carlin would say, when something's bipartisan, it means there's an extra big helping load of <laughs> coming your way. Yes, I, so, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> so so that and uh, but I feel like we as a society we are moving towards a point where people aren't buying it anymore. That we can't you, you can't possibly believe that the United States foreign policy is based on promoting democracy. People still do it. I know, people still but that's why. But they they have to keep pushing it, but it becomes more and more preposterous. Even on MSNBC, you know, I, on, I, I watched this this video that you're going to show us from RT. When RT is on YouTube, it has to have a little yeah. disclaimer at the bottom that says RT is funded, funded by the U.S. By government, the, by the no, by by the Russian government. Ah, that's right. You know? Sorry. And I'm like, how about MSNBC's videos? Are they do they have a little uh, running tally saying you by know this military is funded, industrial funded by the military industrial complex? No, no. they don't. So, okay, I was if, just wondering. If you watch the news, the, the the American news or read American newspapers, you would think that uh, everyone's running around with a knife in their hand in Venezuela, killing farm animal, killing zoo animals for for food. Uh, well, let's actually check in with an actual reporter from Venezuela, from VenezuelaAnalysis dot uh, dot net or dot Harry. Anyway, he was uh, guesting on RT Rick Sanchez's show, and he has a report from Venezuela. It's the exact opposite of what we've been being told. Let's listen. Right now, Juan Guaido is speaking in the east of the city among supporters, once again. You don't know who Juan Guaido is. That's the guy who was elected to the assembly. He, it's, it's the equivalent of Ocasio-Cortez declaring herself president. That's what this guy, who this guy is. He's first term, just got elected. He's a nobody. By the way, he's CIA. So he was he was uh, uh, educated in the United States, and he's CIA, and so they're trying to install this guy as a leader of Venezuela, a puppet to the military industrial complex, big oil in the United States. That's who that guy is. So just so you know who that guy is, that's who we're talking about. Right now, Juan Guaido is speaking in the east of the city among supporters, once again calling on the military to overthrow Maduro, as well as making other announcements. Meanwhile, life continues as normal in most parts 
to the city, people, businesses are open, people are buying things, people are going about their business without any real interruptions, although, you know, as if nothing had happened the past three days, despite the violence that we've seen the past few nights. So kind of different, kind of different than what you're hearing in the mainstream news. I didn't know that. People are actually going about their life. Hmm. So we have a lot more uh, we, uh, coming from this reporter who's actually on the ground. He's going to tell you about that guy Juan Guaido who is just declared himself president. <laughs> he just swore himself in and now he's the president. And by the way, Facebook recognizes that guy as the leader of Venezuela now. So there is no separation between the government and social media. Facebook is the government. Uh, that's what's happening. All right, we're up against a break. We'll be right back with more of this. Everybody, welcome back to the show. Let's get back to our uh, uh, reporter from Venezuela. And uh, he's got a little bit different idea of what the, uh, than the Western media has been telling you about Venezuela. Let's go back. Well, Juan Guaido was speaking to an opposition march in the east of the city, uh, in the middle class eastern part of the city, when he made this self uh, swear, he sw self swore himself in as president of Venezuela. The, of course, the reaction among his supporters was jubilant and enthusiastic, though there, you know, among the six million people who voted for President Nicolas Maduro, evidently there's, you know, a, a sense of rejection and, and confusion of how this previously unknown figure, who was just elected by the National Assembly on the 5th of January, and was unknown to the country beforehand, who won 97,000 votes in 2015, but has not otherwise won an election, is now the president of the country. And you know, these people, the, the, the Chavistas, the, this large block of the population, obviously rejects Guaido and his pronouncement. It's important to note that after his announcement, Guaido literally disappeared and was not seen in public until today when he's giving his press conference now, which is a strange behavior for someone who is now supposedly the president of the country. So that's Juan Guaido. So just so you know, when you see Juan Guaido, that guy is CIA, okay? He's educated in the United States. He's no he's a nobody and he's being propped up as the president of that country. He's not. Uh, this is what they call a coup. And so let's get back to, uh, but is he popular? Is Maduro popular? Let's go, let's see what he says. I think it's really important to note that the, this, this, the, this, things are not going to plan as Washington had for, foresaw it. Really, this coup, as we're seeing in, in progress, has, has hit roadblocks. I mean, as is indicated by the fact that you did not have the massive, interna the unanimous international response they were going for. You, had, you have countries like Mexico and Uruguay calling to mediate. You have the armed forces, and most importantly, the armed forces, despite how many times Juan Guaido calls on them to overthrow Maduro, remain with the Constitution elected president, that is a key factor in maintaining this government. So the fact that Juan Guaido, that, that Mike Pompeo backtracked on his initial refusal to withdraw U.S. diplomatic personnel and are now withdrawing some of them, that's a, that's a huge uh, change in U.S. policy. And clearly there, there is chaos in Washington uh, with regard to what is the next move you know, on the ground because they clearly are unable to unseat Maduro you know, at this time. So the military is behind the constitutionally elected president which he's the constitutionally elected president. And now there's another thing about, well, Jimmy, that those elections weren't fair and fair, blah, blah, blah. The, uh, the people who didn't want UN observers coming to observe the election was the opposition to Maduro. Maduro invited the UN to come in. In fact, lots of organizations did come in and certified their elections. Elections they had just a few years ago, Jimmy Carter said they were some of the best in the world. So that was the opposition party who didn't participate in the election because they knew they were gonna lose and they wanted to do a coup later. So that's what this is all happening. So they try to de delegitimize the election. It didn't work with the people of Venezuela, but now so guys like Trump can say, hey, we're going in. Hey guys, we hope you enjoy this free clip of aggressive progressives on the Young Turks. This is just a preview of what you will receive with TYT membership. That means exclusive interviews, panel discussions, and more of Jimmy, and of course, me. If you like what you saw, you can access full episodes of Aggressive Progressives by becoming a member. Head to tyt.com slash join now.